So I was chatting with one of my creationist friends. He told me the theory of evolution made no sense at all, that the reason people believe it is because they're indoctrinated in school, and that professors only teach it because they fear losing their careers if they don't. My first inclination was to think, wow, none of that is even accurate. But I've been trying to practice finding the components of validity in positions I disagree with, so I wondered to myself, could I find a component of validity in this pompous assertion? Surprisingly, I found that there's actually something there. There's plenty of content out there about the theory of evolution, of course, but there's not much that's actually intuitive or easily digestible to someone like my friend. A lot of it actually assumes that the audience already has a basic understanding of why science is reliable, and much of it points to heavy scientific evidence that people really cannot easily verify for themselves. Sometimes it even concludes that people must accept the theory of evolution because there's so much consensus among scientists. I think I was starting to see why my friend felt a little bit bullied. When I put myself in the mindset of a creationist, scientific consensus really sounds a lot like an appeal to authority, or perhaps popularity, and neither of those are really good reasons to believe something. So I made a challenge for myself. Could I explain the intuition for the theory of evolution in terms a creationist would be able to understand? Of course, I don't really expect a lot of creationists to want to watch a video about the theory of evolution, but that's okay. See, I'm not doing this for them. I've always felt that if you cannot explain something clearly to a reluctant audience, then you don't really understand it yourself. So today, for my own benefit, I want to pretend that you are a creationist, and without citing anything that you cannot observe for yourself, I'm going to try to explain why the theory of evolution actually makes intuitive sense. I like to start on common ground, so let's review how intelligent design works. When I design something, I begin with a crude idea in my mind. Then I start producing variations of the idea. When I have several ideas, I try to throw out the bad ones to make room in my mind for more variations of the good ideas. And after I do this for a while, I gradually arrive at a design that I find satisfying. I think you can probably see where I'm going with this. Intelligent design and evolution actually have quite a lot in common. Point number one, design is a mental form of evolution. The debate between intelligent design and evolution is not really about how it happened. It's much more about where it happened. That is, did the designs form gradually in populations of living things, or did they form gradually in God's mind? Now, wait a minute, you might say. We all have subconscious minds, too, and our subconscious minds think about things when we're not even aware of them. So sometimes designs just seem to pop into our heads fully formed. How do you know God's designs didn't just pop into his mind fully formed? That's a fair point, and we should give consideration to both possibilities. But there is a simple reason to suppose the designs must have formed gradually. See, a good engineer doesn't usually design everything from scratch. Instead, he reuses effective components from his previous designs. That saves him a lot of time and effort. And when we examine living things, we find a lot of similar components. For example, let's consider a squirrel. It has a head, just like you do. Its head has a face with two eyes, two ears, and one nose. It has a mouth that it uses to eat. Inside that mouth, you'll see teeth that it uses to chew stuff. Squirrels poop, of course, so they have a full digestive system, just like you and I do. If you watch a squirrel, you'll see that it breathes air, just like we do. It has left to right symmetry. It has hair, four major limbs. We could go on and on, but I think the point is sufficiently clear. There are a lot of similarities between creatures. If you don't have a squirrel nearby, you can verify this for yourself by looking at a cat or a dog just as easily. So whether it happened in God's mind or within biology, it's pretty simple to observe that it must have happened gradually. Point number two. Similarities between creatures imply gradual refinements. To keep this discussion simple, let's set reproduction aside for just a minute and look at something complex that doesn't actually reproduce, like a car, an airplane, a computer, or a cell phone. Obviously, none of these things just designed themselves, right? 
Well, a lot of people seem to think that's what evolution teaches, that they design themselves. If you thought evolution implied that complex things just design themselves, then you are absolutely right to reject it, because that obviously doesn't happen. But there are some other useful observations we can make from these analogies. Even though cars do not reproduce by themselves, they're still designed with physical prototypes. And the final design is the product of many iterations. So we can easily observe gradual evolution within car designs. The same is true with airplanes, computers, and cell phones, too. Something else I find significant is that the intelligent designers who made these things were not afraid to use tools to do it. In fact, part of being an intelligent designer requires finding the right tools for the job. For example, when I want to mow my lawn, I don't go outside and start chewing on the grass with my teeth. I like to think I'm more intelligent than that. I use a lawnmower because it's a good tool for getting the job done. So I don't think it actually degrades God at all to suggest that he may use tools as well. In fact, I kind of think it's degrading to imply that he doesn't. Point number three, intelligent designers use tools. So next, let's take a look at this tool and see if it makes any sense for God to have actually used it. Suppose I have 42 dice. Each die has four sides, labeled G, A, T, and C. I'm going to roll all 42 dice and just hope they land on the letters that spell Gattaca six times. And it didn't happen. Let's try again. Didn't happen. Let's try again. Didn't happen, so let's try again. Didn't happen. Well, this is obviously a waste of time. On average, it should take me about four raised to the 42nd power tries until it actually happens. I could spend the rest of my life re-rolling these dice, and it would never happen. So if that's how you thought evolution worked, then you were absolutely right to disbelieve it. That would never work. Point number four, evolution is not random. Pure randomness simply doesn't work. Now imagine a designer that had absolutely no ability to discern between good and bad designs. He could still produce a whole bunch of random variations in his mind, but he couldn't do anything to ever improve them because he wouldn't even know if he was making them better or worse. This might be a designer, but he wouldn't be an intelligent one. His designs would be totally random. Well, evolution is like that too. It actually depends on some kind of intelligence just as much as design does. Biologists like to call that selective pressure because it doesn't have to happen in a mind, but I think it's silly to get worked up over terminology. The point is, whatever you call it, evolution does not work without it. There absolutely must be some kind of pressure nudging the designs in an intelligent direction, or else the results will come out just random. So where is the intelligence in biological evolution? It's actually in lots of places, and one of those places is your brain. For example, if you chose to get married, did you just pick a random person, or did you put some thought into it? If you have children, the thought you put into that will affect both their genes and the way they are raised. Even animals are deliberate about choosing mates. They don't just randomly mate with a rock, and all the intelligence that goes into their decisions accumulates from generation to generation. Do you know why sheep produce more wool than they need to stay warm? Because sheep farmers are intelligent. I mean, if you were hungry, would you eat your best wool-producing sheep or the one that produced very little wool? You don't need a PhD in genetic engineering to know that you don't eat your best one, and that's all it takes for intelligence to guide evolution. Do you know why horses are so good for doing work and carrying people around? Because ranchers are intelligent. I mean, which horse would you use to breed more colts? The most useful ones or the lazy ones that won't do much work? Why would you want more of those? Do you know why cows produce more milk than they actually need? Because milk farmers were intelligent. When they were hungry, they didn't slaughter their best milk cows. They slaughtered the ones that didn't produce much milk. So over time, cows evolved to produce a lot of milk. Intelligence is the reason strawberries are big and juicy. Intelligence is the reason corn has such energy-rich kernels. There are all kinds of intelligence guiding evolution, 
and intelligence has been shaping evolution as long as there have been humans around to provide it. Point number five. Evolution depends on selective pressure. It absolutely would not work without it. So hopefully by this point I've convinced you that evolution can happen when intelligence is helping to guide it. But what about before there were any people? What about before there was anything with a brain at all? One possibility, of course, is that God came down and manually bred the thousands of strains of bacteria that exist on the earth right now. But frankly, that sounds about as dignified as mowing the lawn with his teeth. There's another known source of intelligence that he also could have used. It's called natural selection. So let's talk about that. The general idea is pretty simple. If some variation messes up a creature's genes, it's probably going to have a hard time living. It's probably going to die. And dead things just don't reproduce. But if some variation actually turns out to be helpful somehow, well then after a few generations there will be a big population of those. If you think about it, natural selection really doesn't provide a lot of intelligence, does it? I mean, it doesn't have foresight, it doesn't make plans, it's pretty much the bare minimum, tiniest amount of intelligence even possible. And yet, it didn't actually take great intelligence to make sheep woolly. It didn't take a lot of intelligence to make cows produce an abundance of milk, to make horses useful, to make strawberries big and juicy. All that took was small amounts of intelligence accumulating over many generations. And natural selection provides a small amount of intelligence that accumulates over many generations. Now at this point, you might say, I just don't believe it. Life is too incredible. I just can't imagine something so great emerging from the accumulation of such basic intelligence. I just want to say, that's okay. I'm not asking you to believe this. I'm only asking you to understand it. See, it's not good to believe something just because someone else does or because they press you to. Your belief should be a product of your own understanding. So I commend skepticism as long as it motivates you to seek more understanding rather than less. Now let's imagine that these random letters represent the DNA of a single-celled bacterium. This bacterium has no brain, and it reproduces asexually. That means each offspring has only one parent, and it gets an exact copy of its parent's DNA, unless, of course, a mutation occurs. So to simulate a mutation, let's pick one of those letters and we'll change it to something else. Now remember, this mutation won't change the whole population. It only changes the DNA of that one bacterium. So if this mutation is unhelpful, well, that's too bad for that one bacterium. It will probably die. But the huge population of bacteria will continue to live on. And all the other bacteria still have good copies of the DNA. So we'll just follow a different bacterium now by putting that bad mutation back the way it was. Point number six. Populations carry on when one member dies. Because of this, bad mutations are really not such a big deal. They kind of just disappear and are forgotten. But something very different happens when a good mutation occurs. Bacteria with good mutations will eventually die too, but they'll probably have a chance to reproduce before that happens. So the good mutations do not just disappear. After enough generations, they probably permeate throughout the population. So what do you think will happen if we keep all the mutations we like and we undo all the mutations that we don't like? Let's try it and see. Isn't that amazing? No, it's obvious. If you keep all the mutations you like and you undo all the ones you don't like, of course it will end up producing the results you wanted. That's just persistence. So once again, let's remind ourselves, evolution is not random. Sure, there's randomness in it, but it's the selection, not the randomness, that makes great things emerge. Point number seven, natural selection is one thing that guides evolution. To be clear, natural selection is not the only thing that guides evolution, it's just one thing that guides it. Let's consider a few examples of non-biological evolution. A language that no one speaks anymore is a dead language. So natural selection actually guides the evolution of languages. A religion that no one believes anymore 
is a dead religion, also known as mythology, so natural selection guides the evolution of religions. A corporation that runs out of money ceases to be a corporation, and a government that loses the compliance of its people ceases to be a government. So governments evolve to be good at getting compliance, corporations evolve to be good at making money, religions evolve to attract believers, economies evolve to entice people to work. Point number eight. Biological creatures are not the only things that evolve. Technology, fashions, scientific theories, and memes all change gradually over time. That gradual change is what we call evolution. So if you had the impression that evolution was just some kind of attempt to explain away God, you were fed a bad explanation. Evolution is just the study of gradual changes. It's not limited to just biology. It's actually a fascinating subject that gives us deep insights into the way interesting phenomena emerge in all sorts of complex environments. So again, if evolution doesn't make sense to you, please don't just trust me or anyone else. Your beliefs need to be based on your understanding. But I do hope that this video helped you see that evolution is something you can understand, and there's something there worth understanding. And thanks for your interest in learning.